Pode ir. Olá, boa tarde, pessoal. Espero que vocês tenham aproveitado aí a feira dos projetos, que vocês acabou de ter lá fora. E agora a gente vai ter um momento muito especial da nossa conferência. É, a gente vai ter uma palestra do professor Mitchell Resnick, do grupo Lifelong Kindergarten, do MIT Media Lab. É, eu acho que ele dispensa apresentações. né? É, só falar que é uma honra ter ele aqui no palco. A gente está muito feliz de poder ter a presença dele aqui, porque ele é uma inspiração muito grande para nós, imagino que para muitos de vocês. Então, eu vou chamar agora ao palco o professor Mitchell Resnick. It's wonderful to be here in Brazil. Uh, and I want to start by thanking Rosalie and the rest of her team here at USP for putting on this wonderful conference. We organize Scratch conferences at MIT, so we know how much work and effort goes into it. So I really appreciate all of the work that went into bringing everyone here together so we can be sharing ideas with one another over the next few days. I also want to give a special thanks to the Lemon Foundation, who's been a great collaborator of ours over the last few years on the creative learning projects in Brazil. So it's wonderful to find an organization here in Brazil where we can share ideas and really work together to help bring some of our ideas to Brazil and to help ideas from Brazil come back and influence our work at MIT. And finally, I want to give a special thanks to Leo Bird, who's been a great connector between our group at MIT and all of the wonderful creative work going on here in Brazil. So Leo's been my guide to uh, understanding Brazil and coming to Brazil and learning more about Brazil. So it's been great to work together with Leo to make stronger connections between our group at MIT and all the wonderful work going on here. It was great to see the a fair, the creative learning fair, to see the wonderful outpouring of creative projects that we saw there. And I look forward to the next few days to learn more about the activities going on here in Brazil. I was going to start by telling a story that goes back about 20 years. The year was 1999, the last year of the last century, the last year of the last millennium. So there's a lot of talk in 1999 about the changing to a new thousand years, a new millennium. And people were starting to reflect upon what were some of the most important things that happened in the last thousand years, and what were some predictions and hopes for the next thousand years. And I remember I went to one conference in 1999, and I was on a panel and on the panel, they asked us the following question. They asked, what was the most important invention of the last thousand years? Now, that's a long time. A lot of things happened in those thousand years. And the people on the panel had many different ideas of the most important invention of the last thousand years. Some people mentioned the printing press. And of course, that was a very important invention provided ways for people to put their words into print to share with others, to be preserved for long periods of time, to be, sh to be shared over longer distances. Other people talked about the invention of the steam engine, which launched the Industrial Revolution and really changed society in so many different ways. Some people talked about a more recent invention, the computer, that came near the end of the thousand years but maybe will be one of the most important inventions for the next thousand years. And clearly we see how the computer led a shift from the industrial age to the information age and the knowledge age, and is clearly just starting to have a big impact on the world. And clearly those are all incredibly important inventions. But as I thought about it, I thought of something else that I thought was the most important invention of the last thousand years. And my proposal for the most important invention of the last thousand years was kindergarten. Now, a lot of people were surprised 
because many people don't even consider kindergarten to be an invention. It seems somewhat different than the printing press or the steam engine or the computer. But in fact, kindergarten was an invention. It was about 200 years ago that uh, Friedrich Froebel invented the first kindergarten. And he didn't just say, well, let's take school and make a school for younger children. That was not what he did. He realized that to create a school for younger children, for five-year-olds, he needed to rethink what education and learning was about. Because at that point, most schools were focused on someone standing at the front and lecturing and the students writing down word for word and then reciting back. And he knew that was not the right thing to do with five-year-olds. So Froebel really rethought what learning and education might be. And he invented a new approach to learning and education that became kindergarten. And he thought about what do young children need to be able to experiment and explore the world around them, to understand the natural world around them, to start creating things to be, to be part of the world. And one thing I liked about what Froebel did was he was not just an educator, he was also a designer, he was creating things. So he designed, he realized that he needed to design some new objects for his kindergarten. He designed a set of toys that became known as Froebel's gifts. And these gifts were things for children to build with and play with and experiment with. And if you go to many kindergartens today, you can see the current day descendants of Froebel's gifts. When you look at wooden blocks, that was one of Froebel's gifts. And different geometric tiles and different types of sticks these they put together into geometric shapes. So he's created many different ways for children to make things in the world, to be able to make models of the world that they saw around them. And I think that as with Froebel's approach to kindergarten, children certainly learned many important ideas. As they put blocks together into towers, they learned about structure and stability. As they would make drawings with finger paints and crayons, they learned how colors mix together. But I think the most important thing that children were learning in Froebel's kindergartens and the kindergartens that continued afterwards was they were learning about the creative process, how to start with an idea and take your idea and create something based on your idea and to start playing and experimenting with your creation and then sharing it with others and getting ideas from others. Whether you're working together, building a castle, uh, out of, in, a, in a magical city out of your wooden blocks or, or painting a new type of picture of your home or your family with finger paints and crayons. Children are always taking ideas in kindergarten and creating things. And in the process, they both learn important ideas, but they learn about the process of creating things and the process of making projects. And I think there's nothing more important and in fact, I think the ideas from Froebel's kindergarten are more important today than ever before. And Froebel could not have known what life in 2017 would be like, but it turns out that I think kinder, the, the ideas that Froebel suggested in kindergarten are ideally suited for today's society. And the reason for that is, I think in today's society, things are changing more quickly than ever before. You know, so, we all know that things become obsolete more quickly and you have to always be learning new things. It's not enough to learn any fixed set of facts or skills. You have to learn to act creatively and think creatively, to be prepared for new and uncertain situations. And that's exactly what kindergarten prepared children for. They learned about that creative process, how to be a creative thinker, how to take an idea and turn it into something. So Froebel really was anticipating the needs of today's society. But there's a problem because most of schools today and most other educational systems today are not based on the kindergarten. In too many educational systems, the model is more like this, where one person is delivering information to the learner or delivering instruction to the learner. And that might be useful for learning some particular facts, but it's not very good for developing as a creative thinker. So the way that a lot of schools work today might have been okay when they were designed for the era of the steam engine 
and people need to learn some particular skills to work in a particular way. But I think today, both for growing up, for what you're going to do at work, but also what you're going to do in your life and in your community, everyone needs to learn to think creatively. And just having information delivered to you is not the way of doing that. We need to take that kindergarten approach and make sure that we extend that to everybody. Unfortunately, that's not happening in most places. In fact, in many parts of the world, we see the opposite happening. You walk into many kindergartens today and you see five-year-olds working on phonics flashcards or filling out math arithmetic worksheets. In many places, kindergarten is becoming more like the rest of school. And what we think needs to happen is exactly the reverse. The rest of school, in fact, the rest of life, needs to become more like kindergarten. So that's really been the goal of our group at the MIT Media Lab. We're constantly thinking, how can we take that kindergarten approach, which is so well suited to the needs of today's fast-changing society, and make sure that everybody of all ages has an opportunity to learn in that kindergarten style. And like Froebel, it's not just a new approach, we're designing new technologies, the same way he designed blocks and beads and, and tiles. We're thinking, how can you design new technologies to support the kindergarten approach for learners of all ages? And as we've thought about how to do that, over the years, we've developed four guiding principles for how we can take the kindergarten approach and bring it to learners of all ages. And these four principles in English, they all start with the letter P. Projects, passion, peers, and play. So we think the best way to support children growing up as creative thinkers is to give them opportunities to work on projects based on their passions, their interests, in collaboration with peers, with other people, in a playful spirit where they're constantly experimenting and trying new things. So in everything that we do, whether it's developing new technologies or developing new activities or developing new spaces for learning to happen, we're always thinking in terms of these four Ps, projects, passion, peers, and play, and thinking how can we provide more opportunities for children of all ages to work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. Now, we've been doing this for a long time now in our group, so I want to give, tell you a few stories from the history of how our ideas have evolved over time. As we start thinking about these ideas, if we really think that children learn best when they're designing and creating and experimenting and exploring, we thought of what are some of the materials that are already used that way in children's lives. And one of them that was very appealing to us was Lego bricks. With a traditional Lego brick, children have opportunities to build all types of things based on their imagination and collaborate with others on their projects. So we, were very, we felt that the Lego brick was very much in that kindergarten spirit. But to make it work for all ages and to bring it up to work in the 21st century, we thought it shouldn't just be about building structures like houses and castles, but we started thinking, how can we use new technologies, electronics and computers, to make Lego bricks come alive? So we've been working with the Lego company for many years now, and many of you have seen some of the results of that with Lego Mindstorms and Lego We Do. I was talking with some of you about the way you've been using some of those technologies in your work. And we've seen it around the world, where people are now using, building with Lego in the physical world, but then using the computer to make their Lego creations come alive. So if we think that children learn a lot by doing one type of building, this is a great activity because it gives you two types of building. You build structures in the world, you build mechanisms, but you also build behaviors, tell them what to do. But it's not enough just to have this technology get out to the world. We have to make sure that it gets out to the world aligned with those four Ps, projects, passion, peers, and play. So we spend a lot of our time thinking about how can we run classes and workshop to make sure that children use these new materials, these new technologies, in a way that is still aligned with the kindergarten spirit of projects, passion, peers, and play. 
Let me show you a short video from one of the workshops that we, ra that we ran that was using some of these Lego robotics computerized materials, but our attempt to bring it into the kindergarten spirit. So this is a workshop that we ran with a group of children about 9 to 12 years old where they were using different types of Lego bricks but also many types of craft materials just like I saw lots of craft materials at the uh, creative learning fair here. Give children lots of different possibilities of what to build from but then use the computer to make their creations come alive in a playful spirit. The goal of these creative workshops is really to give children an opportunity to come up with their own ideas, imagine something, and then figure out how to design it. We should still keep this play, but take this one. They need to be constantly exploring, experimenting. It works! Whoa. Oh my god! Through yeah. natural discovery, by testing things, by tinkering, by experimenting, by creating. They're using Lego motors and sensors, and then if it doesn't work the way they want, they start revising it. So you have to kind of adjust the motor power so they, it actually has enough power to knock the lights off. So they're really learning through having a goal, having imagining something, and then bringing it to life. So rather than just thinking of the computer of something that I think, what am I supposed to do? They start thinking, what do I want to do with it? They start getting new ideas. I think even in that short video, you can start to get some sense of the four Ps. The children in the video were all working on projects. They weren't given an assignment to get an answer and hand in the answer. They were told to use their imagination to come up with new inventions for a park that they were building. They were all working on projects that came out of their own imaginations, out of their own interests, their own passions. They were working with one another and doing it in a playful spirit. As, the, as was discussed in the video, that they were children were tinkering. We use the word tinkering a lot to describe that combination of playing and making, of making in a playful spirit where you're experimenting, trying new things, testing the boundaries. That's what we mean by play. I sometimes call play the most misunderstood of the four Ps. But sometimes when people think about play, they just think about laughter and having fun. And of course, there's nothing wrong with laughter and having fun, but that's not enough. When we think of play, we think of a playful engagement with the world, a type of attitude towards creating in the world. It's an attitude we are always willing to take risks and try new things and experiment. Because if we want children to grow up as creative thinkers, as is so important in today's society, we need to encourage them to try new things, to take risks. It's okay if things go wrong. In the video, you saw some things go wrong. The balls flew off in different ways, but that gave them ideas of how they could fix it and change it. So we see it as a never-ending spiral where children will start with an idea, come up with, with a prototype, try it out, share it with others. If it doesn't work, they get new ideas, imagine new things, and the spiral keeps going and going. And we could see that in the video here of the children constantly experimenting, trying new things, and developing as creative thinkers. So in my mind, this is an example of that kindergarten approach, but with somewhat older children as they continue to, you know, uh, as they continue to go older, to continue to work in that kindergarten spirit. Now, as we worked with the Lego company and others to help Lego creations come alive, we realized that there weren't enough places that, that were supporting these types of activities. When we were first trying out the first, Lego the first computer controlled Lego at MIT, we went to try it out with children. It was not easy to find good places to try it out. We went to a local museum during vacation week and we brought our prototype there and children came to the museum and they tried out our prototypes and they did wonderful inventions. I remember they built a chocolate factory with conveyor belts that moved and sensors that detected when the chocolate came to the end of the conveyor belt. So children did wonderfully inventive things. They were enjoying the experience and we learned a lot. Some things worked well, some things didn't work well. But at the end of the week, we took the prototypes and we brought them back to our lab at MIT. But then the next week, I got a phone call 
from the director of education at the museum. In fact, it was Natalie Rusk who was in that, in that video. Natalie called me and she said, after school, that the guards at the museum, the security force at the museum, they found some kids sneaking into the museum and they were gonna throw the kids out of the museum because they were sneaking in without paying. But Natalie saw the kids and she saw they were the kids that were coming the last week and building with Lego. So she started talking to them and they wanted to come back and keep playing, keep building and creating with Lego. But they didn't have money to come into the museum. They were just getting in trouble after school. But we saw that they really wanted to work on these types of projects. But we looked around and there weren't good places for these kids to go after school. Now Natalie could have given them a pass to the museum, but the museum was not designed for children to work on projects over extended periods of time. It was full of exhibits. It wasn't a place for children to work on projects. So we decided we needed to create a new place where children could work on these types of projects after school. So we created a place called the Computer Clubhouse. And this was an after-school learning center specifically for kids from the inner city community in Boston where they could come and work on creative projects with new technology. So it wasn't just a place to come and play games or to take a class in some new technology, but a place where they could experiment and do creative work, whether it was with robotic activities or to use videos to make their own videos, or there was a music studio to mix their own music. It was using new technology and new media to express themselves creatively. And we saw that young people really wanted to work on projects like this. And we had lots of kids who started to come and we saw it was a great learning experience. Let me show you another video from one of the early activities we did at these computer clubhouses when the first clubhouses opened in Boston. This was from a clubhouse where the children were given the you know, suggestion that they invent something that would be useful to them in their everyday life using a next generation of the Lego uh, invention technology. So this is from a workshop and what you'll see is a, a piece of a television news broadcast at the end of a couple weeks after the children were working on inventions that they could, that would help them in their everyday life. Yeah, see, it just beeps. Christina Costa is trying to build a better mouse trap. Make that gerbil trap. Every time they want to go inside this gerbil house, they press this light sensor. It's one of the many inventions created at this free math and science camp run by the Computer Museum and the Girl Scouts, where girls from Boston are devising everything from an odometer for roller blades to a diary security system. When someone touches this to try to open the diary, it'll take a picture of that person. So like if your creepy little brother tries to read your diary? Yeah. He's on camera. Yes. <laughs> so this is a pretty old video but I still like showing it because for me, it really, again, captures the four Ps of creative learning. In particular, I love the way that it shows off the passion uh, that these girls were working on projects that they really cared about. And I think that made all of the difference. The first girl in the video, she was working, the one that was working on a house for the gerbil, the little animal, she wasn't just building a house for any gerbil, she was building a house for her gerbil. She really cared about the house because she cared about her gerbil. So she made an automatic door because she wanted to make it easier for her gerbil to get in and out of the house. She also then was interested, she decided that once she had the door, she could collect data about what the gerbil was doing during the day because she was very curious when she went off to school what was the gerbil doing at home? So she kept track of every time the door opened, it would keep track of that on the computer. And when she'd come home from school, she would have some, a better record of what her gerbil was doing during the day. She found out they would have these periods with lots of activity, in and out and in and out, and then hours where it wasn't doing anything. So she got a better understanding of her pet. And if we just you know, suggested to her that we do a data collection activity of measuring the speed of something going down a hill, she would not have been very interested in collecting data. But she became interested in collecting data because she was collecting data in something she really cared about. 
or the second girl who had rollerblades. With her rollerblades, she attached a magnetic sensor so it detected every time the wheel rotated. And it would, it would collect information about the number of rotations that the wheel made. So it's very easy to get information on the number of rotations per second that her rollerblades were making. But she wasn't interested in that. She wanted to know how fast was she going in kilometers per hour or miles per hour in her case. Because when she was in the car with her parents, she knew the car was going 30 miles per hour or 40 miles per hour. She wanted to know how fast did she go in her rollerblades in miles per hour. And in her math class at school, they had given instructions about how to convert from one unit to another, from you know, something per second to something per hour. But she hadn't really paid attention because it didn't really seem to matter very much. But now she had a reason to do that type of mathematical conversion. She cared about it, so she spent a lot of time figuring out. And the results weren't so satisfying because she wasn't going as fast as she hoped she would be going, but she was very satisfied that she was able to figure out exactly how fast she was going in miles per hour. Or the last example with the diary security system by a girl who cared so much about her diary and then connected it with a sensor so it would take a picture of someone opened up her diary. And again, what things are more special than your personal diary? So again, it was something that she really cared about. And we've seen over and over that children and adults too are willing to work longer and harder when they work on things they really care about. And they're willing to persist in the face of challenges and obstacles as long as they work on things they really care about. I think there's a real misconception. Oftentimes, uh, people think that children want things to be easy. So a lot of time, designers of activities and technologies will say, well, let's make it easier for kids. And kids don't necessarily want things to be easy. They want things that they care about. They're willing to work hard as long as it's something that they really care about. My mentor, Seymour Poppert, would sometimes use the phrase hard fun. So meaning that children were willing to work hard when they were having fun at things. So the, the point was not to make things easy, but to make things that they cared about so they were willing to work hard. And that's what we've often done here. Now, of course, we should not make things needlessly difficult. We don't put up extra obstacles. But a lot of things in the world are challenging to learn. But it's OK. Children are willing to learn challenging things as long as they really care about it. And that's one thing we saw over and over with clubhouses. The clubhouses spread around the world you know, as we, you know, we, got, we got some support from the Intel Foundation to open 100 clubhouses around the world. And we saw clubhouses, actually in the top right there is a clubhouse uh, here in Brazil and then in South Africa and Amman, Jordan. So there are clubhouses around the world. And although, of course, there were differences and we see some different types of projects, I think the bigger lesson for us is how similar it is of how children all around the world want to work on projects based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. So it just reinforced our ideas as we saw kids around the world work on a wide range of creative projects. Now, as we worked at the clubhouse, it also gave us new ideas for new technologies that we should be designing. As we talked to children around the world at these clubhouses, one thing we found was that many children, this was in the 1990s and the early part of the 2000s, many children really wanted to create their own interactive games and animations on the computer, but there wasn't good software for doing that. The children that came to clubhouses were not going to be learning C++ or Java. And there was some package software that would let them make particular types of games, but it was very narrow. It was for making one particular type of game. But children have many different ideas of what they want to create. So that software wasn't very satisfying either. So we saw there was a real need for some new software that would provide opportunities for children to use their imagination and create all types of interactive stories and games and, and animations based on their imagination. And that's what led us to create Scratch. So Scratch really grew out of our work with kids around the world and we saw what they wanted, what they were really asking for, 
But we also saw it was going to be a great learning experience as they created their own interactive stories and games. So it's been exciting for us. Scratch launched 10 years ago. This is the 10th anniversary of Scratch this year. We've just seen the incredible you know, you know, creativity that's unleashed around the world. As most of you know, as children build with Scratch, it's somewhat like building with Lego bricks. Although instead of building physical structures with physical bricks, they build programs with graphical blocks. And each stack of blocks controls the behavior of a different character or sprite. In this case, for a game where a big fish eats the little fish. But an important thing we did right from the beginning with Scratch is that we added a button that says share. So when children would create something, they could click the share button and share their creation in an online community. We launched the online community back in 2007, the same time that we launched Scratch. And to us, that was very important. And again, it was because we understood the value of peers, the value of kids being able to work with one another on projects. So we've seen that over and over, how children can build on each other's work, that by making Scratch part of an online community, children have an audience for their work. When they create a game, other people can play their game. If they look at the Scratch website, they can now get inspiration from other projects created by other children around the world. Actually, just yesterday, we passed the 25 million mark of number of projects on the Scratch website. There's now 25 million projects. So it's this great source of inspiration. You go to the website, you get lots of ideas. So the Scratch website provides both a source of inspiration and an audience for your own creations. And it, it, show, and it was our attempt to bring the value of peers into it. I think we've seen over and over that too often when people think about learning and thinking, they're sometimes influenced by, you know that the great sculpture by Rodin of the thinker that's sitting like this. Now, that might be a great sculpture, but I don't think it's a great metaphor for thinking. Of course, we do some thinking by sitting by ourselves in deep contemplation, but some of our most important thinking happens when we're interacting with other people and interacting with other you know, materials and other technologies. So we want to make it a much more interactive process. So we're trying to, you know, by emphasizing the peers in the four Ps, trying to make sure that the social side of learning is always considered. Now, over the last 10 years, we've been very excited as Scratch has grown around the world. This is the number of new members who've joined the Scratch website each year. So last year, there were about 6 million new members joining the site, a lot of them here in Brazil. We've been very excited to see the rapid growth in Brazil and in the Scratch community. But what we get most excited about is not these numbers of the number of people, although it's great that Scratch is reaching more people. What we're most excited about is the diversity of different projects that you see on the Scratch website. So when you go to the Scratch website, you see everything from animated stories to interactive birthday cards to anime comic strips to virtual construction kits to recreations of classic video games to dress up doll games, to tutorials, to interactive artwork, to science simulations. And that diversity we see as a real indication of success. Because if we really believe in the importance of connecting with children's passions, we know that different children have different passions. If we go to the website and we only saw one type of project, then we must not be connecting with the passions of all different children. So whether we're looking at the Scratch website or looking at the results from a workshop, one of our key indicators to success is how much variety is there in the projects that come out of the workshop or on the website. Because when we see variety, it means that we've created the right tools and environment and support to let children follow their imagination and work on all sorts of different things and it's an indication that they're developing as creative thinkers. Now, this doesn't necessarily happen automatically. It's something we all have to work on. I know all of you who've taught Scratch in classes. Earlier today, I was talking with many of you who were running Scratch workshops and classes. I know you all work very hard 
to give opportunities for children to, let their, to, to build on their imaginations. But it doesn't happen automatically. I remember one time I went to the Scratch website in the morning and I looked and like the, I saw like 40 identical projects. And at first I thought it was a mistake on the website, that there was some bug in the website. But I looked and it wasn't a bug on the website. And in fact, each one was from a different name, a different user. But why 40 identical projects? And then I realized what was happening. It was from a school class where the teacher had said, first do this, then do this, then do this, then share. So we had all 40 students do exactly the same thing and share. So of course, Scratch can be used that way, but that's certainly not our vision of using Scratch. So making sure that we don't just put the technology out there, but to make sure it gets used with projects, passion, peers, and play is the big challenge that we have. Now we've been excited to see that in many schools, Scratch is being used in that way, where it's capturing the imagination. When we look at Scratch in schools, in addition to the variety of projects, we get excited when we see Scratch used in many different parts of the school day and in many different subjects. Because we didn't develop Scratch just as a computer science lesson. Of course, when children learn Scratch, they are learning important computational concepts and mathematical concepts. But more important, they're developing as creative thinkers and learning to reason systematically and work collaboratively and learning to express themselves, developing their voice so that they can get their ideas out to the world. And that can be used in any subject. In all subjects, we need to communicate our ideas. So we're very happy when we go on the website and we see the range of, of school projects from different subject areas. It's like, here's a project that was from India. This is from a boy, he's speaking this native language of Kannada. He's from Bangalore. In his class, it was a science class, and they were studying the layers of the earth. And as a scratch project, he made a guided tour of the layers of the earth. So he's explaining what's happening. His teacher explained to us that this boy was very excited to learn that things are moving inside the earth. So what he's saying is things are moving inside the earth. I never knew things were moving. And you see when he hits the water, he had sound effects for the water table. So again, for him, it was a way for him to share what he had learned about the earth and to share until so he was learning about communicating and presenting, but also helping other people learn what he had learned. Now, this was a case where the whole class had learned about Scratch and was using it for this science lesson. In the next example, it's a story about a student who had learned Scratch outside of school, but then asked his teacher, could he use Scratch as part of a lesson? It was in a social studies class where they were studying the island of Rapa Nui, Easter Island, off of South America. And they were studying the history and the culture and the economy of Rapa Nui. So he decided to make a project that was somewhat like the old game Sim City, but instead of Sim City, it was Sim Rapa Nui. It was a simulated world of Rapa Nui that he'd been learning about. It's like he had learned that the economy in Rapa Nui is based on fishing. So to survive there, you need to cut down a branch to make a fishing rod to go fishing, and that helps you survive. But if you cut down too many branches, it's not good for the environment, and the God happiness goes down. So you need to really understand the economy, the culture, um, and the history of Rapa Nui in order to do well in this game. So this is a case where the student brought it in, but the teacher learned about it this way and then spread to other children in the class. One more example from school is from an elementary school where the teacher at the beginning of the year had students start to learn Scratch and then they used it across all of the different subjects. So when they, were doing, when they would read a book, they would do a book report in Scratch. So here's an example of a book report on the book Charlotte's Web. Is there a Portuguese version of Charlotte's Web? Is that familiar? No? Okay. So it's a book that's very popular in the United States. And there are various animals in this book. So in this animation of the book report, it tells the story of Charlotte's Web. So it was, it was used in this language class. But one thing I like about this project is it cuts across the different subjects. 
notice how when the pig moves to the back, it gets smaller. So the student was learning about the art idea of perspective. When, to show things further away, you make them smaller. They also had to use the mathematical idea of scaling. They took the size of the pig and multiplied it by a fraction so it gets smaller and smaller over time. So though this was for a language class, they were also learning art ideas and math ideas. And I think that's true of most project-based activities. One reason why we like project-based activities so much is that they often cut across different subjects. You learn many different things when working on a project, and you learn them in a meaningful way. You get to put your ideas to use in making the project. So I think this student got a better idea about perspective and the mathematical ideas of scaling than if, the, than if they were just listening to a lecture because they got to put their ideas to use in a project. Too often in school, children first are taught certain skills, and then they say later maybe you could use it in a project. But one thing that we have found is that the best way of learning is not learning, learning something first and then using it in a project, but learning something while working on a project, through working on a project, when it's really meaningful to you. And we're excited when we see that happening with Scratch, and we try to support that happening with Scratch. Now, these examples were examples from schools, but we know that Scratch is also used a lot outside of schools, and that also makes us happy because it shows that children really like, they really love Scratch. They want to just make use of it. They're not just being told to use Scratch, but they want to use Scratch. It fits in with things that they want to be doing. So let me tell you the story of one member of the Scratch community and how she got connected with Scratch. So this is a member of the community whose Scratch username is Ipsy. And Ipsy's, she's really passionate about drawing. And she explains that drawing is her favorite hobby. And after school, she would just come home and do lots of sketches of all different types of, of images. And one day, one of her friends told her about Scratch and said, if you use Scratch, you can make your drawings come to life and make your drawings move. And that was interesting to Ipsy. So she tried out Scratch with this friend. And this is one of the first projects that she did. And notice that it's a drawing. And it just has a little bit of animation. The ears are moving and the eyes are moving. Uh, here's the script that she used to make the ears and the eyes move. I think what I like so much about this is that Ipsy was starting with something that she really cared about, drawing, but then was willing to try something new in a small way in order to reach out and to do something new. And I think that's how we often learn new things. We start with something we're comfortable with, and then we reach out and add something new to it. And that's often one of the best ways of learning. Start with what you're comfortable with, but then try something new and bring it into the world that you're familiar with. And that's exactly what Ipsy was doing. And Ipsy found that she really enjoyed making things move and interact on the screen. So she started over time working on more and more advanced projects. This next project, which came several months later, was a project that she made that really got her well known in the Scratch community because lots of people really liked this project. It was a game that was called Lemonade Time. As a game that she made, and the user of the game moves the otter in order to gather different ingredients for making lemonade. So the otter gets clues from other animals about where to find lemons and where to find sugar in order for making the lemonade. So do you then have to move the otter around and you find a lemon or you find you might have to get some money to buy the sugar. Now this game was something that appealed to a lot of the other people in the Scratch community. So if you look at the website for Lemonade Time, you can see 17,000 people viewed this project. Nearly 2,000 people said they loved the project. 88 people remixed the project, meaning that they took some of what Ipsy had done and they modified it to make a modified version of it. They either modified the images or modified the scripts. And we see that's also a great way that many people start to learn in Scratch. They see something that they 
enjoy, and then start making small changes to it. I think maybe 25 or 30% of all the projects on the Scratch website are remixes. I'm looking at, at Andrew, who you'll be hearing from tomorrow, uh, and he says, yes, around 25, 30% of the projects. So lots of people will remix other projects, build on each other's work. And we see that as a great way of learning. We also see lots of comments that people were giving to Ipsy. So 1,800 comments. Some of them were just supportive comments, like, this is awesome, this is a great game. Some of them were suggestions about how you might make the game better. And in fact, Ipsy listened to these suggestions and started improving the game. And you can see it in the instructions here. It says, due to popular demand, the otter walks a little faster now. So Ipsy was listening to what people were saying. Like a good designer does, after they create something, they listen to users and they make modifications to make it, to make it easier to use or better to use. One, other thing that, one other thing that happened in the comments, a lot of people said how much they liked her, Ipsy's artwork. And they started asking Ipsy, can you do some special artwork for us? Because they would want to use her artwork in their projects. So Ipsy then decided to make some projects that just were collections of artwork for other people to use. So here's one of those projects. She calls it Ipsy Studio. And she shows collections of different artwork and images that she had created. And then she writes in the rules, she says, you must credit me if you use any of these sprites. You can edit them as much as you want. So here you can see that Ipsy is really learning to be a good member of an online community because she's learning how to share and that by sharing, everybody benefits. So she says you can edit them as much as you want. But also, it's part of the rules of the community that you should give credit when you, when you build on someone else's work. So she's asking other people to make sure to follow those guidelines to give her credit because she does want to get credit, but she is happy to have other people build on her work and do new creative things. In fact, in talking to Ipsy, she explained it how her own thinking evolved, that many children on Scratch, Ipsy and many others, at first, they're very hesitant about other people using their artwork. They're very possessive. They feel that someone else is stealing their artwork or stealing their ideas. But we have a lot of conversations about that in the community. And it's great to see how many young people like Ipsy start to change the way they think about it. After a while, she was very proud when other people would use her artwork. So rather than feeling that somebody else was taking advantage of it you know, in a wrong way, she felt proud that other people were building on her artwork. So we're really trying to build that way of thinking in the Scratch community. So we have it in the rules of Scratch that everything in the Scratch community is covered by what's called Creative Commons license, meaning that other people have the right to build on your project, uh, but they need to give you credit for it. Uh, and then we try to encourage it on the Scratch website, on the homepage, we highlight the projects that have been remixed the most. So we give, try to give special credit and honor to people who do projects that other people like so much, they keep remixing them. So we're trying to build up a culture where people feel good about building on one another's work. This was a case where Ipsy was sharing her artwork, but Ipsy was also learning a lot about coding and programming, so she, was also, she also started to share her expertise with coding. Here's an example of a project that she did that shows how to make the background scroll in a game. In the Lemonade Time game, you might have noticed the background moved, it scrolled as the otter was moving along. That's not very easy to do in Scratch, but Ipsy figured out how to do it, and then she made this project to show other people how to do it. So she was sharing her expertise um, and even documenting her code, which a lot of people, times people won't do. Uh, but she really felt it was important to help other people learn. This was something that's been very surprising for us, at least for me. When we launched Scratch 10 years ago, I knew that our group at MIT would make some tutorials and we figured that some educators like you would make tutorials. I never imagined that so many kids would make tutorials. But if you go to the Scratch website, you'd see literally thousands and thousands of tutorials of kids helping one another, sometimes with how to program in new ways, like a scrolling background, or how to 
learn different mathematical ideas or artistic ideas, how to use the paint editor in new ways, or even their tutorials about how to make your project popular on the Scratch website. So children are constantly sharing ideas with one another, and we see that is also part of what children are learning, that we see if children are going to grow up to become creative thinkers and to become full and active contributors in today's society, it's not just about learning particular skills, but learning how to use those skills as part of a community. And that's what we're trying to help support in Scratch. So I think if we look back at what Ipsy did, again, we can really see that she was building on those four Ps, projects, passion, peers, and play. Now in Scratch, it might seem obvious, well, of course people work on projects. That's what Scratch is about. I just mentioned there are 25 million projects. But that's not the way a lot of, of coding websites are organized. Of course, there's been lots of interest in the last few years about help, helping children learn to code. But a lot of websites that help children learn to code are not about projects at all. They give certain puzzles for kids to solve or problems for them to solve. And again, kids will learn some different types of you know, computational ideas with that, but they aren't getting the benefits of learning the creative process of working on a project. Where Ipsy clearly was doing that, she wasn't just learning how to do the coding, but learning about the whole creative process of building on a project. She clearly was building on her own passions that she started with something that she cared so much about, drawing, and used that as the starting point. She clearly was interacting with peers in many, many different ways. That she put her projects online, got feedback, modified her projects based on the comments from other people. She got inspired by things that she saw online. She did tutorials to support other people. She made her own artwork available uh, in studios to help other people with their artwork. So she really saw what it was meant to be learning with and from others. And she was doing this in a playful spirit. You can see if you look at the range of her projects, she was constantly experimenting with new things. There are many different types of projects that she worked on. You can even just see that in the few examples that I showed. And to us, that shows the playful approach that she is taking with it. Now, we're really excited to see how many kids around the world are now starting to use Scratch and other tools like it in order to develop as creative thinkers. But we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, that we still, as it expands, we need to do much more to continue to reach more and more children around the world. We have to stay up as, new tech, as technology changes and there are new possibilities, as there are new ways of connecting to physical things in the world, we want Scratch to be able to take advantage of that. As there are more types of online activities, we want Scratch to connect to that. Actually, Andrew and talk tomorrow will talk about some of the future directions we're working on the Scratch team to make sure the kids have the opportunity to work on things that are relevant to, to, to their lives today, to connect with their current interests. So we're constantly working to see how can we make sure that we stay aligned with kids' interests, to make sure that as kids' interests continue to evolve, as there are new opportunities of what they can create and how they can share, do we provide them with new ways of doing that? So we're constantly working on that. We also need new types of activities. We continually get inspired as we go around, as we saw at the fair today, and I look forward to seeing tomorrow at the activities that we hear about everything that's happening in Brazil. We learn so much about how people are using Scratch in their classrooms and workshops around the world to be able to continue to find new ways of using, of introducing Scratch to connect with the interests of kids around the world. But so it's a, never, it's a, it's a, big, a big effort that we're all involved in to try to make sure that we can continue to connect with projects, passion, peers, and play to help children develop as creative thinkers and to stay connected to that kindergarten style of learning. Let me end with a story that takes us back to kindergarten. It was a story I, that grew out of a conversation I had with a friend of mine. And this friend had a daughter who was in kindergarten. Her daughter's name was Lily. And Lily came home one day from kindergarten and told her mother about a friend of hers in kindergarten, Daisy. And Lily said to her mother, Daisy did kindergarten last year and is doing it again this year. For two whole years, I want to do kindergarten again too. So I think Lily was onto something. Clearly she was enjoying kindergarten. 
And I think we all have to worry, and I think she was right to worry that after kindergarten, she might not have those same opportunities to express herself creatively and develop her creative capacities. Because in many places, children after kindergarten don't have that opportunity. So I think the real challenge for us is to make sure that young children like Lily and Daisy are able to grow up and continue to have that kindergarten spirit. That they won't have to worry about leaving kindergarten because as they go on, they'll be able to continue to learn, whether it's in first grade or fourth grade or 10th grade or in college or outside of school, they'll continue to have opportunities to learn in a kindergarten spirit. Now, it won't be easy for us to bring about this change. Current approaches to education are very, have been around for a long time. It's not easy to bring about these type of changes. So it really is going to take all of us working together. It's one reason I'm so excited to come to events like this Scratch Conference, because it's an opportunity to meet with lots of people who I think share some of the same mission, the same goals. And it really is going to take all of us working together in order to bring about the type of changes we're looking for to be able to take that kindergarten approach to bring it to more children and to make sure that all children in all parts of the world from all backgrounds are able to develop creative capacities so they can be full and active contributors to tomorrow's society. Thanks very much. Muito obrigada, Mitchell, pela sua palestra. Thank you a lot. Uh, agora a gente vai abrir para perguntas de vocês. Então, quem tiver pergunta, levanta a mão. Espero levar o microfone, tá? Para vocês fazerem todas as perguntas aqui no microfone. Olá, Mitchell. É, eu espero que tenha gostado do meu origami que eu te dei de presente. E a minha pergunta é, eu gostaria muito de ver é, no Lifelong Kindergarten e aqui no Brasil também um trabalho de origami na aprendizagem criativa. Gostaria de saber um pouco como é que está esse trabalho, porque eu sei que tem um grupo de origami lá no MIT e queria saber se você tem algum contato direto com eles. As it turns out, there is an origami group at MIT, and one member of the Scratch team is a very active origami expert. So we have lots of origami workshops in our group at the Scratch team. So Andrew and myself and Leo and others have engaged with origami workshops uh, with our colleague Ray, who is a wonderful origami artist. So we've learned a lot by working with Ray And I think it's not just an accident that somebody on the Scratch team would be good at origami. I think that as we work on Scratch, we attract people who are interested in all types of creative expression. Scratch is one type of creative expression, but there's so many others. There are many people on the team that play musical instruments and express themselves musically. Others have different forms of artistic expression. Also, origami connects artistic expression and mathematical reasoning, somewhat like coding. So I think that, you know, although we think that Scratch is a wonderful tool to express yourself with, there are many other ways of expressing yourself, and I agree with you, the origami is also one of many other great ways for people to learn to express themselves. So afterwards, I can give you a pointer, or I can tell you who to contact uh, Ray on our team, so I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about his origami work. É, eu fiquei emocionado, Mitchell, porque é, foi a primeira vez assim que eu ouvi você e entendi você, porque eu não falo inglês, né? E eu estou lá em Boston, eu sou da, da, da plaquinha de, de baixo custo, né? Que é o One Dollar Board. E eu fiquei muito emocionado porque, primeiro, eu entendi você e, e que tudo que você faz lá é, no Lifelong Kindergarten tem um porquê muito forte, né? Que é é, a aprendizagem criativa ela realmente muda a vida das pessoas né e também eu acredito muito no, no, no scratch né porque ela tem uma, uma razão filosófica por trás muito mais forte né 
E eu fiquei até emocionado quando você falou da história que as crianças elas não não têm elas não tinham acesso a, a ao museu, né? E então elas iam por trás, né? Mas é mais ou menos o, o, o trabalho que eu faço, que eu, minha principal preocupação é que toda vez que é gerada uma nova tecnologia para a educação, automaticamente ficam excluídas milhões de pessoas. E, e assim, eu sempre falo que no dia que eu achar alguém para seguir, eu vou seguir ele. E como não, não tem ninguém fazendo o que eu gostaria que seja feito, eu estou fazendo, que no meu caso é a redução de custo de hardware, né? porque com o software é bom porque você consegue o computador e você consegue impactar na vida das crianças. E como você faz com hardware, que não é acessível para todos? Né? E eu também estou admirado porque agora eu vi na descrição do Scratchpad né, que já está lá é, de baixo custo. Né? E eu acho isso é, sensacional e também se isso vai se tornar uma, uma nova política dentro do, do Lifelong Kindergarten, né? é fazer que cada vez mais... É, sejam criadas coisas de baixo custo para que mais pessoas sejam impactadas também na parte do hardware. É isso. Obrigado. Yeah. Well, it's certainly part of our mission to provide opportunities for everyone from all backgrounds and all economic backgrounds. So that's very important to us. It's one reason we really made a commitment to make sure that Scratch is free and will always be free. So that's an important part of our, you know, Our, our mission and goals with Scratch. Uh, we do want to do more work with hardware in the future. Of course, it's more important, maybe more important is trying to make it easy for other people making hardware to connect it to Scratch. Because there's lots of creative people around the world working on new types of sensors and motors and lights and ways of making sound and different objects for the world. And all those creative people will come up with some wonderful ways of bringing costs down. And we want to make sure that whatever they create, they can connect it to Scratch. Again, this is something that Andrew will talk about more tomorrow, but it's part of our goal for the next generation of Scratch. Uh, one of our prime goals is to make it easy for everyone to be able to add new types of things to Scratch. So our hope is that Again, we've seen lots of people, yourself and others here in Brazil, work on low-cost hardware. So hopefully we can work together to find ways that you'll be able to connect it to the work that we're doing with Scratch. Olá, Mitchell. Uh, boa noite. Aqui. Uh, meu nome é Ângelo. Em primeiro lugar, uma satisfação vê-lo pessoalmente aqui. Né? O seu trabalho, o trabalho da sua equipe me inspirou a, a, a cinco anos atrás sair de uma cidade, de uma outra cidade do Brasil, Salvador, Bahia, e morar em São Paulo para fazer mestrado na PUC, falando sobre Scratch, trabalho que eu desenvolvi lá com crianças há algum tempo, e, obviamente, me inspirou ao o meu trabalho até hoje também na educação, tecnologia e cultura maker. A minha pergunta, na verdade, é sobre a questão do currículo. né Hoje, o Scratch, basicamente, ele inspirou também o surgimento de diversas outras linguagens visuais de programação, né como CodeMonkey, entre outras. Né? Então, hoje, nós temos uma explosão aí de, de linguagens de, de ambiente de aprendizagem e programação voltado para crianças e adolescentes, né? mas a gente ainda vê muito pouco disso na escola. Quer dizer, nós vemos, obviamente, muitas iniciativas nas escolas com relação à aprendizagem no negócio de programação, mas, ao mesmo tempo, nós vemos também muitas discussões com relação à incorporação da aprendizagem de programação né, no currículo da escola, né? não no currículo extracurricular, mas no currículo propriamente dito. Eu queria saber um pouco da tua opinião, o que você pensa disso, quais são os desafios, né? por que a escola ainda de uma forma geral, ainda não fez, não incorporou, de fato, né, esse tipo de aprendizagem no seu contexto, né, no dia a dia. We know that it's challenging to bring about big changes in the education system. Uh, we know that it's really challenging to bring about big changes in the education system. Um, and to, but I think that there are lots of, one way we sometimes think about is schools have often tended to build various barriers. They build barriers between different disciplines. They have separate class for math, for language, for social science. They build barriers between ages. 
that younger kids don't interact with older kids, to build barriers between inside of school and outside of school, to build barriers between different segments of the day. It's divide the day, divide into, you know, 50 minute chunks. I do think for many of the project-based approaches we talk about requires removing some of those barriers. And that's not easy to do because the whole system has been built up around it. So we try to find ways of bringing about those change. And I think one needs to have two different strategies. There can be a short-term incremental strategy. There are ways to make small changes that can still make a big difference in introducing new ways of thinking and a project-based approach into schools. There's also a long-term challenge of how we can make more fundamental changes to schools. So I think it's worth thinking about both of those things. Uh, and again, I hope at the Scratch Conference those can be discussions that are had about ways that, you know, as we travel around, we see lots of innovative educators trying to bring about those types of changes, whether it's just small changes in order to open up more space for projects or cutting across different disciplines in the school, or bigger changes in the, in the structure of schools. So it's not something that is going to, you know, be transformed overnight, but I'm very optimistic about the long term. I sometimes say that I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. And that's because I know how difficult it is to bring about changes in systems like education systems. I also know how difficult it is to change people's mindsets. People have a certain way of thinking about education and to change the way people think about education is not easy. So that makes me a short-term pessimist because I know how hard it is to bring about big change in the short term. But I'm a long-term optimist because I know the types of approaches that I was talking about today with the four, with projects, passion, peers, and play is much better suited to today's society. And that if children grow up with projects, passion, peers, and play, not only will they be better prepared for the workforce, but they'll also be better, more likely to have joy and meaning and purpose in their life, which is the most important thing of all. So I think over time, as things continue to change more rapidly, more and more people will recognize the importance of creative thinking. And once they recognize the importance of creative thinking, recognize the type of approaches where I was talking about today, will have an easier time coming into, into the world. So I'm, another reason for optimism is the children that we interact with. When we see children at computer clubhouses and on the clubhouse and, and, and the scratch community, we see that they're already looking for change, that they are embracing these new approaches. And my hope is that this generation of children, as they grow up, they will become agents for change as adults and help bring about some of the change. So some of this might take a while, but we, sometimes we need to we keep working on it but we need to keep the long-term vision in place and be, have some patience, uh, but not, not, we have to work really hard at it, but recognize that it might take a long time to achieve this. Uh, Mitchell, boa tarde, meu nome é Wagner, sou de Itatiba, interior de São Paulo. Lá nós temos um projeto, trabalhamos com Scratch já há um bom tempo, em torno de 500 crianças na rede municipal. Uh, primeiramente, eu eu estou muito feliz de estar diante de uma pessoa é, que conseguiu mudar a forma de trabalho, a forma de pensar, o raciocínio lógico, uma pessoa que conseguiu mudar é, é, uma forma de pensar diferente para o mundo. A minha pergunta é, quando você criou o Scratch, você tinha previsão de que com a internet você conseguiria chegar tão longe com ele? É, ou era uma comunidade só norte-americana, Uh, diante do que você vivencia hoje no mundo inteiro e qual a sua, a sua perspectiva do projeto para o futuro, para o mundo, para daqui 10, 20 anos? Obrigado por me perguntar para predicar apenas 10 ou 20 anos e não 1,000 anos no futuro. Mas, eu acho que, desde o início do Scratch, we were hoping that it would be global. So we were thinking globally from the beginning. It doesn't mean we always had all of the answers of how to do that, but that was our goal from the beginning because we saw they were, the needs are the same for children everywhere. And 
we want to provide opportunities for children everywhere. So we were thinking globally from the beginning. And very early on, we developed you know, the blocks so they could be translated. We did that much earlier than a lot of other programming languages would do because we had a commitment to make this global. So we've been very happy that it has spread around the world. There's still a lot of work we need to do because even though the blocks, the programming blocks are translated into 50 different languages, there are many other ways that we need to have Scratch be more localized so that it's better suited and better connected to the needs of local cultures and different places around the world. Uh, the, the team working on the next generation of Scratch, you know, the Andrews leading, is doing, spending a lot of time thinking about the images and sounds in the Scratch library, which in the first version, we were just creating very locally. We're trying to be more global and think about it now, making for the longer term, hoping that it can be open, that more people will be able to contribute images and sounds from their local communities. So we're trying to put a foundation in place so it'll be easier for more people to be able to connect to Scratch in ways that are most meaningful to them, both through the media that's used, through the sample projects that are used. There's a lot more we need to do. And then in the community also, that more than half of the people connecting to the Scratch website are from outside the United States. But the website, even though there are other languages spoken there, is still English dominated. And our, clearly our goal is to make it multilingual so that everyone should be able to communicate on the website. And there are many big challenges that we are thinking about, but we don't have the solutions yet. Like what's the right mixture between allowing people to interact with people in the same language so they share some common basis, but we also want people to connect with other people from other cultures and other languages. And how can we support both of those at the same time to, to be able to connect with things you're familiar with, but also connect to the unfamiliar? So we've tried to find what are the ways we can make the right mixture of those things is one of our goals. And again, these are goals that we're getting started with in the next generation, but we'll take a, it's an ongoing effort to do that. So those are some of the long-term efforts also. When you talk about 10 or 20 years, some of these things to make it truly you know, localized and global will take a long time, but that's part of our long-term effort. When I think of other long-term goals, I do see goals, again, being here in Brazil, I think of the work of Paulo Freire and his literacy efforts. And I do think that we see our work in Scratch in some of the same spirit and I've been very inspired by him, that when Freire you know, talks about you know, having everyone learn to read and write, it's not just about learning those skills to get a job, but, learn those skill, you know, but learning to read and write so that you have a voice, that you become a full participant in society. And we see coding in the same spirit now as sort of an extension of writing. So we really wanna see, when we look 10, 20 years, the coding really is seen as something uh, that is important for everybody in order to not just, you know, in a workplace setting, but in a way for them to develop their voice and to be able to share their ideas and to develop their identity from the way they express themselves. So the same way that people can do that with writing and that Freire and others have supported and advocated for that, I think that's part of our long-term goal with Scratch. And we see parts of it happening already, but it's a long-term effort to really, you know, make that, make that happen around the world. Hello, oh. oi, aqui. É... Como muitas crianças, no nosso país pelo menos, são criadas por avós, eu queria saber se existe alguma, alguém no laboratório que se preocupa em estudar o Scratch para idades mais avançadas, que também não tem experiência com tecnologia, e se a criança está com os cuidados do avô, que não entende nada de tecnologia, e essa, esse adulto não tem uma ferramenta como Scratch voltada para ele, pode dificultar também que a criança venha se desenvolver. Ou seja, queria saber se existe alguém ou alguma preocupação em desenvolver um Scratch voltado para pessoas de 50, 70 anos. It, 
You to, it's not something that we have an active, formal effort on. We do a lot of informal things. I think many of us have tried to introduce Scratch to our own parents or younger people on the team to their grandparents. So we've explored it informally and we've seen other people running workshops. We have some colleagues at Harvard, also in Cambridge, near where MIT is, that have run some workshops using Scratch with senior citizens. So I do think that there's you know, interesting work to be done there. And I think in the ways that we develop Scratch, I think if we do a really good job of developing Scratch for young people, then I think a lot of the ways that, a lot of the decisions we make for making it you know, work well with young people also work for seniors. Now we might need to have some specialized things the same way that we might want to have some other images and sounds for different cultures, we might want some different images and sounds for different ages as well. So I do think that's an area that would be good to work on and to bring together, I think a lot of the work that we've seen has been not just for seniors by themselves, but for seniors working with their grandchildren. And they can learn with and from one another. It's not just seniors teaching their grandchildren or grandchildren teaching their seniors, their grandparents. I think each has something to learn from the others. So I think what I find most interesting is how they can be learning from one another because they each, the seniors from their experience with learning have a lot to add and the children from their willingness to experiment and to dive in have something to contribute. So I think there's a lot that they can learn from one another and I think that is a, it's a, a good area for exploring. We aren't doing so much now, but I think it's a great area for people to look at. Boa tarde. É, Mitchell, meu nome é Rui. É... Alô? É, eu queria perguntar, eu sou professor, trabalho com Scratch dentro da, da área de matemática, com projetos integrados, e a gente vê a, a dificuldade que é o professor trabalhar em projetos integrados por conta da formação acadêmica que não preparou a gente para trabalhar de forma integrada. E matemática continua numa grade, ciências, e é tudo segmentado, e essas gavetas do conhecimento não se comunicam. Qual o trabalho e como é o approach que vocês têm com professores e formandos, graduandos lá das universidades, para que eles saiam da universidade com essa é, prática já de desenvolver projetos e utilizar a programação como uma ferramenta e não um simples objeto que a criança tem que programar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're right to point out that uh, we need to think about changes in the professional development of educators to help prepare them for new styles of teaching and learning. And we see some schools of education are making those types of changes. Uh, I see some great examples from one of my former students, Karen Brennan, is now a professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she takes a lot of the ideas that we talk about in Scratch and applies them at the graduate school level uh, and working with educators for them to experience it directly and to prepare them to bring those ideas into the classroom. So, and we see other universities doing that as well, but we need more places, you know, taking those types of actions to make sure that, as you were saying, that they learn about a project-based approach, cutting across disciplinary areas. Also, recognizing that they don't need to have all of the answers. We find one real uh, limitation is that too often teachers are hesitant to introduce something new because they don't feel that they have enough expertise. So we want, when we run workshops for educators, we try to encourage them to be willing to learn along with their students. That's not easy to do. We're all somewhat hesitant about showing what we don't know and learning in front of others can be challenging. But I think we need for teachers to become more comfortable with that. But in some ways, that's the most important things their students could learn is to see their teachers as learners, to see that learning continues to go on and to see how their teachers keep learning things could be the best thing for students to learn. But I know it's, it's not an easy transition to make, but I totally agree with you that starting in teachers' colleges and teacher development, pro, professional development programs, trying to introduce some of these new approaches to learning so that 
the next generation of teachers is prepared to, to bring bigger changes into the classroom. Uh, Micho, here. Well, let me just say one more thing, sorry. But when I, was, I was just realizing, when I mentioned my former student, Karen Brennan, I should mention, if you don't know, Karen started a website called Scratch Ed, Scratch for Educators. So if you just Google Scratch Ed, you'll find it. And that's a place where educators are sharing ideas very much in connection with the points you were raising. So you see teachers on Scratch Ed raising these questions about how to use Scratch in a way that cuts across disciplines uh, and to use it in a project-based way. So going there, you can see how other teachers are working on these issues. It'd be great if you join and also contribute your ideas as well. Micho, here. Primeiro lugar, eu gostaria de parabenizar e agradecer a sua palestra foi sensacional, seu trabalho, o trabalho do MIT, principalmente o, o trabalho do Leo vem, vem realizando aqui no Brasil também, esses contatos com a gente. Nós temos um trabalho na Universidade Federal de Alfenas, conhecido como Pensando em Códigos, onde nós trabalhamos é, as teorias socioculturais no aprendizado de programação, com base em bigodes. E aí, eu vi na sua apresentação, você falando dos peers, que é um dos P's, né? Eu queria saber se está tá em desenvolvimento do Scratch um feature de compartilhamento e colaboração dentro do, da programação. Porque no nosso, a gente tem um curso online é, e a gente sentiu falta de haver essa colaboração na programação. Só tem o compartilhamento, mas não tem o peer, a colaboração, para que mais pessoas possam programar junto. Eu queria saber se o MIT está trabalhando nessa colaboração na programação. Yeah. It's certainly something that we've talked about. We are not actively working on it right now. There are some technical challenges, but those could be overcome. I think for me, some of the biggest challenges are safety and security issues. As soon as you start having collaboration, it makes it easy for people to start to have private conversations online. In Scratch, we've set it up so that all communication in Scratch is public. And that's a way to prevent some of the you know, uh, issues that might arise from private conversation. So that's, the, I think, the biggest challenge that we face. Uh, there are also some other design and engineering challenges. But even before dealing with those, how to address the question of, allowing people to collaborate in real time, but reducing the challenges that come about from private communication. So that's the big challenge that we're, we've talked about a lot, and we want to continue to think about it, but right now we haven't come up with good solutions on ways of dealing with it. So it's something we will try to deal with later. Okay. <laughs> É, minha pergunta é na, na questão do, dos próximos passos aqui. Where, where? Aqui. Okay. Okay. A minha pergunta é mais na, na questão do, dos, de alguns limites que eu tenho enfrentado com o Scratch. Ou eu tenho dado aula para alunos que chegam do, na universidade sem saber programar nada e, e conseguem fazer um, um jogo bem complexo ao final de um semestre. E, ao final, eles querem continuar e me perguntam coisas como posso colocar esse meu programa no celular, no smartphone? Tem coisas assim também que eles querem fazer jogos mais longos, tipo RPG, e aí precisaria salvar o contexto para continuar o jogo no outro dia. Isso eles não conseguem também com Scratch. Alguns limites, como o rapaz falou lá de colaboração, no sentido de que quando um vai mexer no programa, o outro também mexe e às vezes dá um, um, uma versão prevalece. Eu acho que precisava ter um mecanismo de travamento, como tem em outras, outras ferramentas de gerenciamento, de compartilhamento. E, é, é, a princípio, são esses alguns do... Eu, eu, eu tenho outras ferramentas para tentar é, satisfazer esses alunos, mas são bem mais complicadas, né? Stencil, Goldot, Unity, eles, o, o, 
tamanho do, do passo tecnológico para essas ferramentas é muito longe com relação ao Scratch. Aí seria interessante que o Scratch pudesse suprir algumas dessas necessidades. Eu acho que ficaria, o pessoal ia ficar mais feliz. I'll give some answers to that question. But you should ask Andrew that question tomorrow also, because as you know, in thinking about sort of future versions, uh, the, the team has been thinking about a lot of that, and it would be great to, for him to share his thoughts also. I think there are many different directions we can go with Scratch, and we have to make some choices. One thing is we want to make sure that we never lose sight of you know, doing a great job for beginning users. So we want to make sure that we don't do anything by adding new advanced features. It could intimidate or make it more difficult for beginners to get started. So there's always a balancing act there. And I think the challenge becomes maybe even more so when you're in the community, because we don't want people coming to the community, and if they see a certain type of advanced project and they feel, this is not a community for me, so we have to figure out the right way to make sure that Scratch is always welcoming to a very broad range of people getting started and people who want to work on a wide range of different types of things. So that's always in our minds to make sure we don't lose that. Now, within that constraint, we are always looking to how to add new possibilities and new features. And some of the things you are mentioning are things we're working on, and you'll hear about some more tomorrow, like having Scratch projects be able to run on your phone. We see that as something that would be great if we could have that happen and that everybody would benefit from that. If there are easy ways of doing that, you know, that would be great. And so we're working on ways to make the projects that you create be able to run in all different types of devices. So those are things we think would be great. With some of the things of having persistence in what you're working on, we made a step on that, to, to step towards that with the cloud data. So we experimented. And we constantly think about how we might add more. But again, we want to, you know, there's always a question of how much to do, you know, at what time. Um, I think for certain types of advanced computer science features, we might just allow it for other languages to deal with it. If someone really wants certain types of advanced computer science features for a computer science class, they might need to use another language. You know, the, the variant of Scratch called Snap basically came about because they want to add more advanced computer science features. And we didn't prioritize them enough because we didn't, it wasn't our core audience and we worried that it might uh, either take away too much of our own energy and focus, but also it might not be ideal for the audience we were aiming for. But actually I think it's great that SNAP is out there and for people who want to do some more advanced computer science, learn some more advanced computer science concepts, they can start with Scratch and move on to that, and that can be a solution as well. So I think it's a combination. There'll always be, we always will want to keep our focus where it is now on the audience. We'll try to add more features that will work for everybody, and you'll hear about some of that tomorrow. And then try to make good bridges that if we're not going to be able to provide it, try to make it so that people find good pathways to go from Scratch to other things where they can you know, continue to grow with the things they want to be doing. Boa noite. Bom, é, em primeiro lugar, eu gostaria de dizer que eu estou assim, bem emocionada até de conhecê-lo pessoalmente, honrada por estar aqui. E, na verdade, não é uma pergunta, mas eu acho que eu vou dividir uma preocupação é, com todos, incluindo o professor. É, eu sou aqui de São Paulo, estudei aqui, me formei aqui, trabalhei na PUC durante muitos anos e fui recentemente para Manaus. Prestei um concurso e agora sou professora de lá e estou lá desde fevereiro, passando um calor infernal. Vocês não sabem como eu fiquei feliz quando eu desembarquei aqui em São Paulo. Um friozinho maravilhoso. Então, mas... É, Manaus e toda a região norte do, do país é um outro Brasil, completamente diferente. Aliás, eu acho que a gente tem... No Brasil, nós temos vários Brasis, até dentro da cidade mesmo de São Paulo. É, e a minha preocupação, hoje, ela está muito focada lá na região que é onde eu estou. Então, quando eu vejo Scratch, programação, computadores, 
e me deparo com uma situação no Amazonas, onde a gente tem lá cerca de 62 municípios e 300 comunidades, comunidades que já ganharam, inclusive, notebooks, né? tribos, gente com notebooks, tablets, mas que não têm energia elétrica e que, portanto, não são utilizados. É, então, há um Brasil imenso em que o Scratch está muito distante, mas muito distante mesmo. E eu vejo que a gente tem que pensar nesse Brasil também. Né? Todos nós empenhados muito fortemente e gostaria de ver esse empenho também. E sei que já existe o um empenho do Haiti e de vários órgãos internacionais, mas a minha preocupação é muito grande porque estou vivendo a realidade lá. Né? Então eu vejo que há muita necessidade, muita carência e a gente está completamente, a região, à margem de qualquer progresso nesse sentido, a tecnologia está bem distante, embora seja uma região tão importante para o mundo. Né? É, o futuro do planeta está lá, mas está muito mal cuidado, está muito isolado. E há pessoas, sim, que trabalham dentro dessa perspectiva, e até por isso que nós somos muito para lá, enfrentar esse desafio e ver como que a gente pode tentar melhorar essa situação. E aqui é mais um pedido de socorro e uma divisão de preocupações, de tentar é, fazer com que toda essa evolução e toda essa possibilidade seja de fato para todos. Ampliar a extensão disso para o nosso Brasil inteiro e para a região norte do país. Né? Então é mais um pedido de socorro e tentar ver como viabilizar isso através de projetos que possam, sim, levar tecnologia para lá, internet para lá. Não existe internet. Você sai de Manaus, a Manaus ainda é muito ruim, o sinal, e você saiu da cidade de Manaus, praticamente inexiste o sinal da internet. Falar em compartilhar site, programas, eh, animações, projetos, é inimaginável dentro... Da, da realidade da região norte do país. Então, como que a gente pode ir vencendo isso gradativamente? Né? Claro que há soluções é, pequenas, mas eu penso no futuro, e sou um otimista também com relação ao futuro. Pessimista não agora, mas com uma visão de futuro. Mas a gente tem que ir trabalhando isso né? gradativamente, como que vocês veem a nossa situação nesse panorama, né? de um Brasil à margem totalmente da tecnologia. Well, I do think it's important to have the to have an overall mission of reaching all children and making new opportunities for children everywhere in all circumstances. Now there are a lot of circumstances we don't understand as well, aren't as familiar with. I think it's one thing that's really helped guide the work that Leo is doing. It definitely has been one of the, his motivations is to make sure to reach out to all parts of Brazil. And I know it was discussed earlier with the Creative Learning Fellows, making sure that there were fellows from different areas so that there'd be input to get better understanding of what the needs are in different parts of Brazil. So I think it's an important part of what we want to do in our collaborations with Lemon Foundation and others is to make sure that it reaches all different parts of Brazil. So I think having ongoing discussions with Leo and the Creative Learning Fellows to see how can we continue to make sure that the ideas that are shared come from all parts of Brazil and that as new activities, technologies are developed, that they meet the needs of everywhere. And of course, different things might be appropriate for different places. There might not be one new technology that works everywhere, but to make sure there's effort to support the learning and the development for kids in all places. Certainly, it is an important goal for all of us. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and inspiration. Pessoal, obrigada por hoje. Alguns recadinhos importantes. Não esqueçam aqueles que vão estar aqui amanhã e depois de trazer o crachá para conseguir ter acesso aqui ao local. Amanhã nós vamos estar aqui 
a partir das 8h30, para receber vocês, para assinarem a lista de frequência, etc. As atividades começam às 9 da manhã. Então, a mostra interativa começa amanhã às 9 da manhã. Então, por favor, venham. E para quem... É, cheguem antes, a partir das 8h30, para assinar a lista. Quem está com os fones hoje, por favor, não esqueça de devolver na saída e pegar seus documentos. Por favor, mais algum recado por hoje? É só...